Dahmer, Lakenang, De Bartleben, Berdella, and others. At the core of these criminals is a need for control. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 real-life crimes that inspired criminal minds. Why do you think the suspect in 2001 stopped sending the letters? I have no idea, but if he hadn't, it would have been much worse. Worst part was not knowing when it was going to be over, feeling safe opening mail again. For this list, we're looking at episodes of Criminal Minds that were influenced by or directly adapted from real true crime cases. Which of these cases fascinates you the most? Let us know in the comments below. Number 20, Blood Hungry. The unknown perpetrator in this season one episode is Eddie Mays, a young man in his 20s suffering from psychotic delusions and consuming the blood and organs of his victims. Reed mentions Richard Chase in the episode, AKA the vampire killer or the vampire of Sacramento. For Richard Trenton Chase, the vampire killer, he drank his victim's blood because he believed that aliens had invaded his body and were slowly drinking his blood. Mays was likely based on Chase, as they were both involuntarily admitted to a psychiatric institution, experienced delusions, and used drugs heavily. In January 1978, Chase killed five people, four of which were in the same home he broke into. We have a sick son of a bitch. We have to catch this guy. Even experienced police officers had never seen anything like it. He similarly drank the blood of his victims, though his weapon of choice wasn't a knife like Mays, but rather a handgun. Chase was charged and sentenced to death in 1979, but took his own life a year later. So for me, this is somebody who always wants to be in control, and he was very much in control until the end. Number 19, Identity. A recent abduction takes the team to Montana, where their unsub Francis Goring has already taken his own life. In searching for his last victim, they discover he had a partner, Henry Frost. Francis Goring abducted three women. We're looking for a fourth. Now, he took her while her husband and son were in a store. They find a collection of explicit tapes showing Goring assaulting women. Goring and Frost appear to have been loosely based on Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, former Marines who kidnapped tortured and murdered between 11 and 25 people in the 1980s. Lake and Ng are a dominant and subservient pair of lust killers. One having the lust fantasy, the other going along with the lust fantasy. When arrested, Lake swallowed a cyanide pill, dying four days later. At his property in Wilseyville, California, police found detailed journals and graphic videos of the crimes, as well as human remains. Many of these crimes uh, were referred to uh, in code. He would code name a different planned killings or crimes with names. While Frost was killed in the episode, Charles Ng was found guilty of 11 murders and sentenced to death. Number 18, Unfinished Business. This episode revolves around the Keystone Killer, later revealed to be Walter Kern, who murdered seven women in the 1980s, then abruptly stopped. He sent out written communication identifying himself as the Keystone Killer. These letters, all of which were accompanied by a word search puzzle, were part of his game. Like the son of Sam, he taunted the police. 18 years later, the killer begins again and sends a letter with a crossword puzzle to former FBI profiler Max Ryan, the man who couldn't catch him. Kern shares a lot of similarities with Dennis Rader, AKA the BTK killer, including his proclivity for taunting letters and crossword puzzles. His evil is a different evil, mainly because he thinks that he's entitled to it. His name was Dennis Rader, but he would go on to create a murderous alter ego for himself a brand of his own. Both men also had very similar MOs, served in the Air Force, and worked as alarm installers along with other jobs that allowed them access to people's homes. Like BTK, the Keystone Killer had a cooling off period before sending more letters and finally getting caught. Finally, the infamous BTK was off the streets and in custody. Number 17, The Tall Man. This JJ-centric episode takes the team to her hometown of East Allegheny, Pennsylvania, where two teenage girls have gone missing. A third girl, Allie, stumbles out of the woods in bad shape, saying she saw the tall man hurting her friends. According to her, the tall man held them and cut them repeatedly. Now, that is consistent with the legend. So the tall man is your classic don't go into the woods dare. While the actual crime is different, the local urban legend is reminiscent of the viral sensation Slenderman, 
which inspired two girls to stab their friend in 2014. Anissa Wire and Morgan Geyser attacked their friend Peyton Leitner to show their worthiness to the fictional character. So did you guys talk about doing this beforehand? Anissa told me we had to. Why? Because she said that he'd kill our family. Who's he? Um, a man. I didn't know him. Morgan was also diagnosed with schizophrenia, just like Allie. Fortunately, Peyton survived her wounds. Anissa and Morgan were apprehended and charged as adults for attempted murder. The girls were very clear with police that they were trying to kill the victim. They wanted to do it as, as a sacrifice to Slender Man. Number 16, The Tribe. The BAU is called to New Mexico after a group of college freshmen are found murdered in an empty house. It is a grisly scene showing evidence of ritualistic methods of violence, which they trace back to a cult led by Jackson Callie, AKA the grandfather. Like Manson, Callie's been forced to become an expert profiler of sorts. He reads the people around him, he finds a way in, and then he brainwashes them to serve his needs. Like infamous real life cult leader, Charles Manson, Callie ordered his followers to carry out multiple murders. Both wanted to start a race war between white people and a minority group. Manson's ambitions turned increasingly violent, believing a race war was coming and that the Beatles were sending him secret directives. For Manson, it was African Americans. And for Callie, he instructed his followers to make the killings appear to be committed by Native Americans. Callie also had a similar past as Manson, and both men were skilled at finding the most impressionable people to join their families. He created the Manson family cult, attracting a group of devoted young followers, some of whom would ultimately kill for him. Number 15, True Genius. While investigating Zodiac Killer copycat murders in San Francisco, the team comes across Caleb Rossmore and Harvey Morell Jr., former child prodigies who bonded over shared interests in chess and true crime. Check. When they were teenagers, the best friends killed a local kid in their town, Robbie Shaw, and got away with it. Morell and Ross Moore are likely based on the murderous duo from Chicago, Nathan Freudenthal Nate Leopold Jr. and Richard Albert Loeb. Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, wealthy, well-educated teenagers who had done it, they said, for the sheer thrill. In May 1924, Leopold and Loeb carried out their plan to commit the perfect crime, killing Robert Bobby Franks and using acid to obscure his identity. Like Morell and Rossmore, their motivation was simply for the thrill of it. They were the last people who had any reason to commit a kidnapping, much less a murder. Number 14, A Shade of Grey. What begins as a missing persons case ends in tragedy when Kyle Murphy's body is found in the woods. At first, the crime was blamed on Hugh Rollins, a registered sex offender and suspected killer in the area. Life in Trenton might as well be a death sentence. Are you sure? You don't want to tell me where Kyle is? However, Kyle's older brother Danny, who has anger issues and shows signs of sociopathy, admitted to Emily Prentice that he was the one who fatally hurt Kyle. After you did that to Kyle, how did you feel? Like I get in trouble? This is a case inspired by the unsolved murder of Jean Benet Ramsey in 1996. Among the many theories in the case is that her older brother Burke could have killed her accidentally and was protected by his parents. Two competing theories lingered for years. Did an intruder break in and kill? Or were the Ramseys themselves somehow responsible? Another detail in the episode is that the Murphy crime scene was contaminated, just like Ramsey's. Number 13, Lucky. Season 3's memorable unsub Floyd Phelan Farrell has aspects of several serial killers, but the most prominent is likely Jeffrey Dahmer. I never in my wildest nightmares thought that uh, it would become a reality. The obvious connection here is that they both ate their victims, although Dahmer didn't do this with all of his victims. Farrell was institutionalized when he was young and developed a strong interest in Satanism. You hear voices, Floyd? I'm not smart. But I have a smart friend who tells me things. What's your smart friend's name? He wants me to tell you something. Dahmer dabbled in the occult, but mainly followed and struggled with his Christian faith. While their victimology is different, their preferred disposal and preservation methods are similar. Farrell's appearance is very Dahmer-like, glasses and all. And 
both were pulled over with evidence of their murders, but managed to evade capture. Copy. Slow down, buddy. Number 12, hostage. Gina Bryant escapes from the home in Missouri where she'd been held captive since she was young. Last night, uh, this girl, Gina Bryant, flagged down a police car in St. Louis. She was wearing nothing but a dirty nightgown. She was barefoot, and she told them she had been kidnapped when she was eight. Michael Clark Thompson, the man who abducted her and two others, gets caught trying to go on the run with the oldest victim, Amelia. Rossi references Ariel Castro, the man who kidnapped Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Georgina Gina De Jesus, imprisoning them in his Cleveland home for nearly 10 years. Amanda told the police, I ain't just the only one, it's some more girls up in that house. Like Amelia, Amanda gave birth while in captivity. In 2013, Amanda was able to escape with her daughter and get help. In both cases, the girls suffered severe mistreatment and miscarriages. But Thompson is shot by the mother of Sheila Woods, his third victim, whereas Castro took his own life after serving one month of his life sentence. Number 11, Omnivore. One of the BAU's most memorable unsubs is George Foyette, AKA the Boston Reaper, who killed 20 people from 1995 to 1998. The case went cold because he suddenly stopped killing. 10 years later, he returns to pick up where he left off and goes on a spree. He essentially is a predator who will kill anyone. Why is he so democratic? Because his kills aren't just about his victims, he needs recognition, he needs us to know. He's been likened to the unknown Zodiac killer due to their similar methods, victimology, and penchant for taunting law enforcement. Reaper seems to see himself as the personification of fate. However, Foyette may be an amalgamation of a few killers, like the equally prolific and elusive phantom killer behind the 1946 Texarkana Moonlight murders. It was after the second double murders they started using the name Phantom in the local newspaper. No one felt like he or she was safe. Foyette was also able to maintain a seemingly normal life, like the intelligent and charming Ted Bundy. Number 10, Natural Born Killer. You killed all these people. Hundreds of them, and only one woman. This first season episode concerns a professional hitman by the name of Vincent Parada, who is often hired by mob bosses. After kidnapping his victims, Parada would inflict pain and suffering on them, and then dispose of their various body parts. This fictional hitman is inspired by Richard Kuklinski, who is perhaps better known as the Iceman. I've heard. people that mean everything to me. Like Parada, the Iceman allegedly worked as a hitman for the mob, preferred male victims, was tormented as a child, and had a personal vendetta against his father. He's learned to take the pain, and it's why he has no compassion for anyone else's. You gotta trust us. Unfortunately, the crimes of Kuklinski are hard to corroborate, as he is known to exaggerate. He was officially convicted of five murders, including the death of a police officer with connections to the mafia. Is that all you've got left is hate? That's all I've got left. Everything that I ever cared for is gone. Number nine, Broken Wing. In season 14, a nurse by the name of Douglas Knight injected his victims with opioids and masked their deaths as tragic overdoses. Don't leave. Don't leave me. Don't. By doing so, he successfully evaded both suspicion and capture, at least for a little while. The character of Knight is heavily influenced by Donald Harvey, an angel of death from Ohio who worked as a hospital orderly. Unlike Knight, Harvey did not have a single modus operandi. Rather, he was known to harm his victims through a variety of methods, including cyanide poisoning, suffocation, shutting off ventilators, and injecting HIV into his victims' bodies through tainted fluids. He was quite bizarre and on certain levels, raised some doubts as to whether or not this guy was reciting some sort of fantasy. While Harvey was officially convicted of 37 deaths, the true number could be as high as 57. Number eight, The Company. In this harrowing episode, Derek Morgan's cousin Cindy Burns is spotted for the first time in many years. Hey! Cindy? The Behavioral Analysis Unit discovers that Cindy was forced to sign a slave contract, 
enduring years of physical torment at the hands of her stalker, Malcolm Ford. What we have is a bond you know nothing about, but I'll tell you about it if you ask permission. She lived in fear of an organization called The Company that would go after her family if she didn't submit to him. This is identical to the real-life case of Colleen Stan, abducted by Cameron and Janice Hooker on May 19, 1977, forced to sign a slave contract and kept prisoner for seven years. After seven years and a dangerous escape, Colleen faces her next big challenge, how to heal. Stan's captors also threatened her with a fictional company that would supposedly harm her and her family if she tried to escape. Number seven, The Perfect Storm. Honey, I need to know where. Where the girl is. Don't you mean they need to know? Amber and Tony Canardo of season two's The Perfect Storm have many real life precedents. One is Ian Brady and Myra Hindley a couple responsible for five youth deaths around Manchester, England between 1963 and 1965. The couple have been front page news ever since. Ian Brady wanted to commit the perfect murder. Another influence is David and Catherine Burney, who abducted and murdered four in Western Australia in 1986. A fifth victim escaped and led authorities to their location. So we drove past the house. She actually became quite upset when she pointed the house out. And at that point, we realized everything she said, we were satisfied that everything she said was absolutely accurate. You know, we were convinced it just wasn't a made up story. But the DVD commentary reveals that the biggest influence on the episode was the case of Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. This was a Canadian couple who kidnapped and murdered numerous people in the early 90s. Homolka didn't lift a finger to save her sister from Bernardo. Number six, Ashes and Dust. Another episode from season two, Ashes and Dust concerns serial arsonist Vincent Stiles. A pharmaceutical salesman by day, Stiles would sneak into the homes of wealthy businessmen, douse the place in kerosene, and set it on fire with a lighter. He would then watch the families burn while wearing protective equipment. <laughs> I'm sorry you lost me. The innocent family, you know, the victims. That's what the suit's for, right? So you can see the terror on their faces. This story is loosely based on the case of Paul Kenneth Keller, a serial arsonist from Washington who is directly mentioned in the episode itself. There was a serial arsonist up in Seattle, early 90s. Paul Kenneth Keller? Yeah. He used to drive around all day selling advertising for his dad's agency, picking out places to burn. Keller set over 100 fires and caused $30 million in damage between 1992 and 93. In the fall of 92, Keller set fire to a Seattle retirement home, resulting in multiple senior deaths. He is currently serving 107 years in prison. It's very hard to rationally explain why I did that, because there's no rational reason. I was not angry at Trinity, I was not, but I was very empty. And perhaps I thought that others needed to be as empty as I was. Number five, the 13th step. Ray, it's conforming. It's not conforming. Saying you own me. That's an old fashioned way of looking at things. Ray Donovan and Sidney Manning were the subjects of the sixth season episode, The 13th Step. Hailing from North Dakota, these two terrorized the Northwestern United States. <laughs> what do you want me to do? There's nothing you can do. <laughs> You're sorry <laughs> for the <laughs> Yeah, baby. The couple committed multiple mass shootings, causing numerous deaths at gas stations and an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. While the duo shares some similarities with Charles Starkweather and Carol Ann Fugate, they were mostly influenced by the legendary crime spree of Bonnie and Clyde. Fueled by passionate love, the desire to escape poverty, and utter contempt for authority, Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow united. They too targeted rural gas stations and claimed upwards of 13 lives, including nine police officers. Number four, riding the lightning. The BAU sets up interviews with inmates and former couple Jacob Dawes and Sarah Jean Mason, hoping to get some information on the possibility of more victims before their executions. Do you ever smile? I mean, it's hard to trust a guy who never smiles. Are there more bodies? If I told you that, 
What would I have left for myself? Like John Wayne Gacy, Dawes was physically mistreated as a child and grew up to be a prolific serial killer who buried victims' remains beneath his floor. But he and Sarah Jean are also likely inspired by English couple Fred and Rosemary West, who committed horrific crimes against young women, including their own children, from the 1960s to 80s. The great mystery of the whole thing is what drove them to do this. While Rose took an active role in the crimes, Sarah Jean did not. However, she felt immense guilt for not trying to stop her husband and goes through with the execution despite not actually being guilty. I am standing here because of choices I made. Don't let my son be Jacob's last victim. Let me go. Let us both go. Number three, To Hell and Back. Serving as the two-part fourth season finale, To Hell and Back concerns murderous brothers Mason and Lucas Turner. What's that? Mason is the leader of the operation, manipulating his brother, who is mentally disabled, into committing dozens of crimes. You don't have to tie me up, Lucas. Mason says always. Mason doesn't want us to be friends, remember? Their horribly violent crime spree culminated in a staggering number of deaths. How many victims were there? A hundred? More? Do you even know for sure? They shared a lot in common with Robert Picton. Both committed their crimes in Canada, both were pig farmers, and both used their barn animals to dispose of their victims' remains. Do I think he acted alone? I think he acted alone most of the time, but I don't think he acted alone all of the time. They also targeted lonely people like sex workers and those with substance use disorders to prevent high-profile attention. Number two, minimal loss. The fourth season episode, Minimal Loss, is a little different. Rather than focusing on one or two specific criminal minds, it concerns an entire cult and its eccentric leader. Acknowledge him in all things and he will guide your way. Drink to acknowledge him and I will guide our way. The cult is the Sepitarian sect, whose compound is located in rural Colorado. Its leader is Predator Benjamin Cyrus. God will forgive me for what I must do. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Cyrus is mostly based on famous cult leader Jim Jones, who oversaw the People's Temple. Like Cyrus, Jones made his followers drink poison. And while Cyrus's poison scheme was a bluff, Jones's wasn't. And hundreds of People's Temple members died on November 18th, 1978. I think the lessons of Jonestown is to really go within so you don't have to go without. It's better to live for a cause than die for it. The disastrous hostage crisis at the rural compound also shares many similarities with the deadly Waco siege in 1993, which resulted in the deaths of many Branch Davidians. A huge numbers of Americans watched this play out on their television sets, and the ending was incredibly horrifying. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, our darkest hour, the longest night. I'm not afraid of you. You really think that matters that much to me? Turning in his scariest performance since Pennywise in this two-parter, Tim Curry portrayed Billy Flynn, who is nicknamed the Prince of Darkness owing to his penchant for taking lives in the dark. He would usually strike during a rolling blackout, breaking into a house and murdering most of its occupants. Get up! You okay? <sighs> you think they'll remember me now? The influences behind Flynn are many, but he is largely based on two specific people. The first is Gordon Cummins, who struck during wartime blackouts and claimed the lives of four women in 1942. The other is Richard Ramirez, a.k.a. the Night Stalker. Such is his reputation that extra security was set up outside the courtroom, and many spectators crowded around for a glimpse of an accused serial killer. Both he and Flynn had horrible teeth. Both broke into homes in the dead of night, and both were accosted by a gang of angry civilians. He said something in Spanish about, uh, I'm lucky the cops are coming or something. Because he knew that we were going to, everybody was going to finish him. All the neighbors just hung together and got him. 